Oh, and Thank you so much for joining us, friends. I am so delighted in the midst of this summer, beautiful summer afternoon, evening. Where else could you be? 50 million places. <laughs> and here we are suddenly together. I don't take this for granted. And I hope that even as you see rectangles, you see this circle. Um, and if you feel so comfortable, so moved, thank you. I love seeing those of you that are on camera. It sends shivers down my spine and it makes the love of the community that much more palpable in all of our lives. But welcome in body, spirit, on camera, off camera, and let's have a raise of hands. Who loves to garden? <laughs> and who has gardened more than five years? Who's gardened more than 10 years, 20 years? Yes, amazing. Anyone who's gardened more than 50 years? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And is this anyone's first year gardening? <laughs> I feel like it's always my first year gardening. <laughs> and welcome, friends. Welcome. And we all have something to learn. We all have something to share. And I am delighted to learn and to share us all together tonight. My name is Petra, Petra Page Mann, and I grew up in my father's garden right here in the Finger Lakes in Naples, New York, where we currently grow our fruition seeds about 10 miles south of where my father's garden was. And although we didn't have a name, I didn't, we didn't intentionally, I didn't say, oh dad, let's go succession sow more peas. <laughs> we nonetheless had lettuce all summer and beets all summer and dill all summer long. And so succession sowing is just another word. There are so many words, but it's this idea of how do we continue to sow seeds all season long so we can seamlessly be harvesting all that we would dream of so we can share all that we would dream of. So I'm honored to dive into a bunch of ideas, strategies, and songs tonight. And I would love to begin as we always begin with some words or a song, story, poem, or sometimes all of the above. And today, some words from Robin Wall Kimmerer from her luminous essay, Corin Spetter on the honor system. And I'm already crying, so hold on, bear with me. <laughs> I remember. I remember how their songs drew us up through the warming earth just for the joy of hearing them. How we stretched in the sun and turned air into sugar. My sisters and I, leaves, our roots intertwined. It's lonely here without them. Grandfather Tio Sente has gone, been gone so long. And where is that gentle guidance when we need it most? And our good people with toes and hoes in the soil fulfilling the agreements we made so long ago. What, happens to, what happened to the songs we knew that helped us grow? I remember how they celebrated my beautiful children with feasting and honoring and pass them hand to hand in thanksgiving. I remember when they knew my name. The people have forgotten, but the sea remembers. <sighs> Grab your hankies, friends. And thank you, Robin Wall Kimmerer, for reminding us always we are in such a deep relationship. And I would like to start this evening with a song, friends, because we need more songs. We need more singing in our gardens. The seeds, the strategies, the soil, they are all a part of this. But let's sing a song to begin. And I'm delighted to share this song, a quick little ditty. And it's actually a song that my mother taught me. And I love to sing this in the car with her. And for my many years, of hitchhiking across continents. <laughs> this was always my favorite song to start off the journey with. And so it's a quick little song. I'm going to share it, sing it twice through. And then I actually made a little recording on my phone. So I'll play that so I can sing you the harmony on top of it. So feel free, make sure to put yourselves on mute because this is a delightful song that's delightful to sing along to. And if you didn't already know, Zoom makes a cacophony of, <laughs> well, everything and especially singing together. So feel free to sing along, but do put yourselves on mute 
first. Without further ado, we give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. And we give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. We give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. And we give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. It's such a fun, delightful little song. So here, perhaps this will work. This is a little recording on my phone and hopefully you can hear it. We give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. And we give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. We give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. We give thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. So thank you, Robin. Thank you, countless generations that have sung so many songs. And I don't know who to thank for that song. I thank my mother, and I know that is a Black spiritual, and I don't know how deep those roots go, but those roots send shivers down my spine. So as we sing songs, and let's talk about succession sewing as well. So we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, and I'm also going to endeavor to keep the time that I am here at the beginning lecturing you all how arcane <laughs> as brief as possible so we can have a really vibrant q a and so stacy at any time let's just step back for a moment and thank stacy and the menden library and all of the greater rochester libraries who are hosting and making this evening possible for us let's just thank them for a moment and stacy we love you and if people find they have questions feel free to, especially clarifying questions, tuck them in the chat right away. And if it's a big existential question, we've got plenty of, <laughs> I've got plenty of those myself. Put those in the chat too, and we will get to those hopefully within the hour as well. So I would love to share with you some ideas about timing, accuracy, crop variety type spacing. We're going to talk some strategies. We're going to talk containers. Then I'm going to share some common mistakes. And then we're going to dive into just a, the free for all of the Q&A. And I can't wait. So without further ado, let's just check in. There are a few crops that we don't want to succession So. And those crops take a much longer season to grow. And so whether it's tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, tomatillos, ground cherries, popcorn, flint corn, dent corn, note, sweet corn, you can totally succession sow. But especially here in zone five, you don't want to be having a long full season. You don't want succession sow a full season corn. Whole beans also and dry beans that are bush beans it's you only sow those first thing you don't succession sow those perennial herbs and flowers we also don't succession sow you can totally sow them now you don't have to wait till next spring if you haven't already sown them but we don't succession sow those and oh my gosh other long season annual herbs and flowers so for example crispidia or herbs like parsley that take their time germinating or time oregano i mean you can establish these but it just takes their time germinating and they tend to not be as marvelous so that leaves still a ton of seeds namely greens and bush snap beans and cucumbers and zucchini and tons of the quick growing herbs and beets and carrots lots of roots so there are so many things within those and in lieu of just listing all of those off i've shared a lovely chart with stacy so perhaps you've already gotten it and certainly in the replay um, stacy will also be sending that out and in the replay on our website you'll find a little link below of how to get that sent straight to your inbox and those shares the crops that are good to sow three months before final frost which is for us here in zone five in the finger lakes basically mid-july and that also includes two months before frost and one month before frost so this marvelous succession sewing chart that keeps it simple and delicious um, for this and for lots of seasons to come and next i want to talk about in terms of these seeds that we sow there are some varieties that thrive as succession crops 
more than others, especially in terms of disease resistance. And so disease resistance, I mean, oh, I'm just starting to hear about powdery mildew <laughs> arriving in New York. And certainly downy will be coming really soon. And so there's all these diseases as well as insects that over winter down south where it doesn't frost. And then as the season progresses here in the north, that those airwaves are those spores and wings are just flying our way. And so now is the time that suddenly that disease resistance makes a huge lot of difference. So if you're sowing cucumbers, summer squash, zucchini, if you're sowing dwarf peas for the fall, PS, fall peas are my favorite peas, just make sure that they have powdery mildew resistance and downy, if you, and we have a lot of different varieties that have both powdery and downy mildew resistance for all of those crops and then some, so that when you're sowing these later season crops that will have more disease pressure, you can be sure that you are sowing seeds that will intrinsically have that resilience. And I also just wanna put in a plug because that disease resistance will not make a difference. If you aren't attending to the needs those plants have culturally, in terms of fertility, in terms of spacing. If you have those disease, that powdery mildew resistant cucumber, and you're growing five of them in a five inch circumference, <laughs> they're still going to succumb to all kinds of things and not surround you with abundance for all kinds of reasons. And so, yes, you want to be sure that you know that although disease resistance, there's no such thing as a silver bullet and disease resistance comes close, but it still is only a tiny slice of the pie compared to otherwise surrounding your plants, sowing those seeds to set them up for success. And I'd also, so yeah, let's talk strategies too, because in terms of succession sowing, you can direct sow, you can also transplant. And so here's kind of some pros and cons to both, because as Malcolm Gladwell so beautifully says, advantages are not always advantages and disadvantages are not always disadvantages. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both direct sowing and transplanting. So in terms of direct sowing, direct sow. If you don't love starting seeds, keep it simple. <laughs> love yourself. Your seeds will know the difference and surround you with that much more abundance. So if you don't love to start seeds indoors, even though you can start them outdoors this time of year, if you don't love to transplant them, go ahead and direct sow them. Also, just keep in mind that root vegetables, there are some that just don't want to be transplanted at all ever. So that includes root vegetables as well as baby greens and herbs. So if you're just sowing, for example, mescaline mix, that's going to be just seed, seed, seed every eighth of an inch, there's no advantage to transplanting. It would be virtually impossible to transplant. So just keep in mind that there are some that really do best many seeds that do best when direct sowing. And transplanting, we do a lot of transplanting. We transplant everything we possibly can here at Fruition because we don't love to weed. <laughs> and this just in, when you plant a seed and it starts to sprout and germinate, there it's surrounded by other seeds that some people might call weeds <laughs> that suddenly are germinating as well. And so you end up doing a lot more weeding when you direct sow compared to transplanting and you're transplanting this lovely little sprout that is a few weeks ahead of the game. And so also if you mulch a lot, mulching, if you can't really direct sow into mulch so well. You can pull it aside and then direct sow and then bring it back. But I love to just have a nice six inches, beautiful mulch bed and bring it back and then transplant this beautiful basil plant, this beautiful you know, lettuce plant, this beautiful seedling right into it and then bring the mulch right back around the base so that we have done no weeding good thing we can go for another swim <laughs> and maybe do another Instagram live. These are the, <laughs> these are the joys. Um, so also if you love seed, start seed, starting seeds indoors, transplanting is just a great way to continue that love. And also if you want to optimize time and garden space, which just putting the brakes on to remind ourselves that if we're talking about optimization of time, space, efficiency of anything, we are most likely also asking questions that lead us toward models of 
abstraction, of transaction, of thinking of how do we not be a part of an ecosystem, but how do we dominate a system if we're talking about efficiency and efficiency alone. So just with that 21st century neoliberal caveat, <laughs> I do love to optimize a lot of our garden space. <laughs> so I do love, you know, if you sow seeds, um, you're going to have a, this let this mix, for example. So our dear friends, and here I am in our friends Bill and Carol's garden here in Ithaca, and Bill and Carol sowed this beautiful lettuce back in the spring, and it's starting to bolt. And they've been, you can see where they've harvested a leaf, and a leaf, and a leaf, and a leaf, and a leaf, and, a leaf, and now it's starting to elongate. It's still pretty delicious, but I am a big fan of bitter. <laughs> Most people would say, Petra, that is not lettuce anymore. Um, but this is a lettuce that we, that I'm pulling out for them to sow new seeds. And so as I pull out these, this plant and sow new seeds, there's going to be at least three weeks before they harvest anything. Whereas if I had come fully prepared with lettuce transplants for them, I would be pulling this out now. I'd be adding more compost to their bed. And then I would be putting in this two, three week old transplant and next week they could be harvesting lettuce already. And so if you want to just tighten up that time space <laughs> in between harvests, so yes, that's where transplanting has another advantage. So yes, I'd love to just walk through now a quick little check-in about how I love to succession sow. So there's lots of different options, different strategies, but here is the general progression. First things first, once I determine that these peas are done. <laughs> this garlic is harvested and curing. Now I'm going to pull, make sure, um, of course, garlic you pull up by the roots, beets you pull up by the roots, but this lettuce you could cut off. I'm encouraging you to just pull it out. And you can see I left lots of soil on the roots, but really when I'm doing this for Bill and Carol, I'm going to be knocking all of this beautiful soil back into their beautiful raised beds. You want to be maintaining every bit of this soil. It's one of the most incredibly sacred and finite <laughs> resources, life sources here on earth. So you've done a lot of work over the years and you will only continue to feed your soil more and build your soil more. So yes, dig up the root, pull it up by the roots, leave as much soil as you can, and then bring this plant to your compost, to your neighbor's chickens, <laughs> or to your chickens. Ducks also will be very fun. And now you can add fertility. Before you sow more seeds, add fertility. Despite, I love, it's easy to say thank you after you've received, but how can we say thank you before we receive? So before we sow seeds, we're building our soil, we're nourishing, we're adding compost, maybe our granular organic fertilizer, deciduous leaves that have been well composted. Any number of things can feed your soil. And so add your fertility and then make sure that your soil is nice and moist after once before you sow. And then certainly <laughs> it's ideal to sow your seeds and then have it gently rain. And if it's not going to gently rain, water them in. And I love to not only put in water, but to put in fish emulsion, fish emulsion that's diluted so that it's not just that moisture that is actively like lubricating the soil and helping that seed coat swell and break open, but there's nutrients there, right? Because the seeds need snacks. We all need snacks. If we're going on a journey up a mountain, bring snacks or maybe even two sandwiches, not just one. So anytime that you can be watering in seeds, seedlings with dilute fish emulsion, dilute compost tea, dilute worm castings tea, you're just setting your plants up for that much more delicious and nutrient dense success. And then if you are a person that loves to mulch, go ahead and mulch. If you're not a person that, love, don't, that wants to mulch, then don't mulch. And whatever you do, take notes. And of course you don't have to, it's entirely optional. 
admittedly, I'm not great at taking notes. I think I'm going to remember everything that I've noticed. And I'm learning that I am very, that's very untrue. So perhaps you've seen it's a moment for a shameless plug. <laughs> we have our across the seasons calendar and it's true at fruition. We have extensive spreadsheets. Thank goodness for part, my partner, Matthew, who is so much more organized than I am. So you can certainly use spreadsheets or little pieces of memo paper strewn around wherever. And this is kind of a somewhere in between where as a perpetual calendar, it has dates, one, two, three, four, five. And instead of Monday through Sunday, it has years. So you can see here's July 2020 and here's July 2021. And so I love seeing all of these patterns as they emerge across the seasons, which is why we call it across the seasons. So take notes of when you're sowing things, of when you're harvesting eggs, when the cucumber beetles come in, when the indigo buntings return, when the trillions are in bloom, when your mother comes to visit. <laughs> These are all things that I take notes in our garden calendar because it's not just celebrating um, the garden of our gardens here surrounding us with green, it's the celebrations and gardens of our lives. And so, yeah, I'd love to just um, take some, share some thoughts on common mistakes people make, and then let's dive straight into Q&A, friends. So, yeah, in terms of common mistakes, number one, too little fertility, which is in general something in gardens and certainly in succession sowing, especially in succession sowing because you've just harvested beets, or certainly in the case of how many of you are about to harvest your garlic, us too. And so garlic is one of the heaviest feeding crops in your garden. And so especially with those heavy feeders, it's so vital that you be returning fertility to the soil again and before you're asking it to give anything else. So whether it's compost whether and whether it's granular fertilizer or even if you just have dilute fish emulsion that you can like literally water on, anything is better than nothing is one of the many things I have learned around the years. <coughs> Pardon me with a nasturtium in my throat. <laughs> and a final note on soil and fertility. If you haven't already tested your soil this year, go ahead and do it. We have a sweet blog on soil testing made simple. And indeed, I hope that it becomes a simple and fun pleasure for you. I know for me, it took a few years of getting it, getting into a rhythm or routine with it. It seemed like just another thing. But if you haven't already tested your soil, it's so crucial. It's such a wonderful way to fully know. You can see a lot of what's happening below the ground by what's happening above the ground. And it's a little like putting on a snorkel and actually getting into the Great Barrier Reef, going underwater when you get the soil test, as opposed to sitting on your pontoon boat with a margarita thinking you've experienced the Great Barrier Reef if you're just here above the ground in your garden. So another thought, water and weather with succession sowing. And I'd love to just say again, sowing and transplanting before gentle rains is just the dreamiest introduction to life on earth for the newest generation of our plants. And so if you know there's going to be a big thunderstorm, for example, and perhaps even hail like it did literally an hour ago where I'm standing. <laughs> it's ideal to not sow right before a heavy rainfall, but anytime you can sow before a gentle rainfall, that is marvelous. And water seeds in well, especially in the heat of summer. Although we live here in the Northeast and it blessedly rains, it doesn't rain consistently. And what we're seeing and all the climate shift modeling that we see, we'll, we'll have about the same amount of rainfall as we have historically, but it will fall all at once <laughs> in dramatic events with longer periods of dryness and in fact, drought in between. And so that makes it that much more essential, especially if you're direct sowing, especially something like carrots that can take two plus weeks to germinate, even in the height, the heat of summer. 
it's so important to have those seeds be surrounded by moisture constantly, right? Just imagine what it's like to be this little seed breaking open its seed coat, sending out its radical, its root first. Seeds always send out their roots before their shoots. And so if you send that root down into dry soil, it's just going to dry up and not going to emerge again. So yes, keeping that seed coat, that seed bed totally moist consistently as those seeds are germinating is another one of the common mistakes that people make. Another little note on that, Floating row cover is your friend. It's kind of an amazing tool. And certainly if there's no holes in it, I wouldn't do this. Leave your floating row cover with, without holes for the sacred mission of excluding insects from your zucchini, from your cucumbers, from plants that need it most, from your broccoli, from having those cabbage moths land and lay their eggs so that the larva can just strip your leaves to midrib. So yes, if you don't have holes in your row cover, don't do this. But if you're anything like me, you wear clothes or shoes for a few years and then, or a few days <laughs> and there's holes. <laughs> and so as soon as you have floating row cover that has holes, now you can use it for laying over that empty bed, whether it's truly empty or whether it's mulched, but you've seeded into mulch, lay it over that empty seed bed that has it's not empty because the seeds are just laying latent waiting to germinate and that floating row cover will help any rain that does fall it won't fall as much with as much pressure and so it doesn't disperse seeds it doesn't disperse soil it helps soil remain moist and it helps the soil actually be a few degrees warmer as well. So if in that warmer soil, seeds will germinate all the faster. So floating row cover with plenty of holes laid over your freshly sown seed bed will hasten germination and help out your succession sowing in grand ways. Two more thoughts I'd love to share. Where did it go? It's a really common mistake people make and me at the top of the list for all of these mistakes. Wait, there's no mistakes. There's only learning opportunities. I sow seeds and I think that I will remember for the rest of my days where I sowed them just like the gray squirrels and all of their <laughs> scattered acorns. Label your plants. And I like to not only label with a name, I like to label the date as well. Because sometimes I'll walk by and be like, wow, why, hasn't, why haven't those peas germinated yet? I mean, it's been so long. And then I'll look at the date and I'll be like, oh, it's only been four days. <laughs> so hold your horses, Petra. So anytime that you can label anything in your garden. And certainly I love our friend Pisa just a few weeks ago was sharing how she loves to sow some things. Um, and just as a surprise, let them delight her where they <laughs> pop up. So don't defer that joy as well by labeling everything so that you won't forget anything. I love hiding Easter eggs and finding Easter eggs. So feel free, I don't want to dissuade you, but know that I always think I'll remember things that I often don't. And maybe you're like me. And also keep in mind, it's really easy for those succession sown seeds. If they're close by other plants, they might not get as much light. And so that's another reason to just make sure that you're spacing things well and to keep in track of where you're planting things in the garden too. And yeah, I just want to make sure too, as a final note too, that harvesting is deceptively simple and there are a lot of little facets and I'd love to just share a few with you. Um, oh, Stacy, did I see you say Petra in the chat? I'm sure there's tons of questions and we can just dive right in there. Well, there is a really interesting one. Oops, I lost it. I lost the chat box. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, it's from Brooke Coffee, and I just thought it was really cool. So do you have some rhymes for the phenological clues for succession planting? So for example, you give phenology for first sowing, like when the lilac first blooms, but what about when the maples for, first start to blush? put your last lettuce seeds in or something like that. With climate change, I feel like I need to use phonology more than dates as mother nature is smarter than my calendar. Your thoughts? Absolutely. 
I could not agree more with you, friend. And thank you for seeing me, Brooke. And thank you for taking these kinds of notes yourself. I mean, honestly, you'll see in our Across the Seasons calendar, so many things in the garden, but you'll see even more things that are just like when the cicadas start to sing and when the blackberries are ripening, when the mulberries are ripening, when the oxide daisies are blooming. So you'll see my calendar is just full of those little ecological notes. And I mean, I'm, I am under no illusion that it is that any one of those factors is going to dramatically move the needle. But that's where I think just broadly paying attention is going to make such a big difference. And so I, that's a really fun thought. And I haven't, I haven't thought of it that way as like, yeah, let's play that game for the rest of the summer. So here we go here and let's, this is a broad invitation for us all as we're just, you know, building this new world as we're living it. So I kind of think of succession sewing with these three next milestones three months before a final frost two months before a final frost and one month before a final frost and so and just very loosely knowing that final frost is also this like wildly could be could be mid-september could be mid-october it's knowing that it's a very broad and incredibly moving target um i think loosely as that three months before a final frost is being mid-July, two months before final frost being mid-August, and one month before final frost being mid-September. And so those mid-September crops, they've got to be cold hardy. They're definitely going to get frosted. They've got to mature quick and cool, cool soils. And there are plants that totally dial that in. So yes, there are, let's absolutely pay, let's all be paying attention. What are those things that are happening mid-July? What are those things happening mid-August? What are those things happening around us in mid-September? And so, yeah, I don't want to pretend at all to be this person that is like, my last, my last intention would be to be like, well, I'm sewing something, now let's all sew it. <laughs> and rather, I'm gonna be like, well, I, it's really fun to pay attention. What are you paying attention to? Here's what I'm seeing. <laughs> um, so Brooke, thank you for that beautiful invitation. And yeah, let's continue to pay attention and keep this as a moving conversation in our lives. <laughs> um, Phyllis also has a question. Do we need to fertilize after growing peas or would that add too much nitrogen to the soil? Ooh, good question, Phil. So yes, quick backup. Phil is asking an amazing question. Peas and beans as well are legumes fixing their own nitrogen. Can we just back up and talk about how plants are amazing for a moment? Peas, beans, and all legumes. So those black locusts that are all over the place and so many others all around on every continent except Antarctica. They are fixing their own nitrogen. Those are plants with symbioses with bacteria that are not just adjacent to the roots, but literally are welcomed inside their root structure, inside their cellular membranes. And those bacteria are taking atmospheric nitrogen and they are turning it into bioavailable nitrogen. So they're taking, nitrogen is all around us <laughs> in the air. <laughs> and then they're turning it into different forms of ammonia, honestly, like NH4 and turning it into molecules that can actually be taken up by plants. And so, but honestly, while this is totally a thing, because we're generally eating our peas and beans before they're going to seed, they're forming nodules, but not a ton. And so they are adding, they are totally adding nitrogen, but not tons. So still please add compost, add our granular um, fertilizer, add something because it's not just nitrogen your plants will need coming up in that next succession. They need the phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium, and boron, and calcium, and, and, and all the other 100 plus micronutrients that are, are crucial for their well being. Awesome question, Phil. Um, Loreen wondered Do some seed packets actually say powdery mildew resistance? And if not, how do you know what's PM resistant? 
Thanks for asking. Yes, uh, on our packets, they'll say, um, especially if it's a cucurbit, if it's a, a squash, cucumber, or melon, um, you can also go on our website, fruitionseeds.com, and you'll find there are some, you can make filters. So you can go to our squash, you can go to our cucumbers, and you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, that if you'll be able to, to search and select, search for plants that are disease resistant, and then it'll pop up in the search um, of all the disease resistant plants. And one more, Brooke has another question. What is your favorite disease resistant cucumber? My favorite disease resistant cucumber, I have two because like any mother, how can I choose just one? <laughs> but it's true, I do have several dozen cucumber children and I am choosing these two. <laughs> Judge me, <laughs> if you only if you must. So here are my favorite two. In terms of a cl what we would classically think of as a cucumber, my favorite of all time, and it happens to be disease resistant, specifically powdery mildew resistant, is salt and pepper. And salt and pepper is this delightful little pickling cucumber that is white and super sweet, super creamy, super crunchy, all at once, a really small seed cavity, just so prolific, especially with that extra disease resistance. And they're just beautiful. So yes, I love salt and pepper. And number two, a rose by any name would have many names. And so I love cucamelons also called mouse melons, also, also called Mexican gherkins or Mexican sour gherkins. Um, and there's a number, senditas, there's a lot of lovely name for these. So they are basically, they're a different, same family, but different genus species. And think of like big grape sized cucumber that looks like a miniature watermelon that when they're small, they taste like a cucumber. When they get a little bigger, which is still the size of a big grape, <laughs> they start to taste like they've been pickled already. And so these delightful creatures are, because they're entirely different genus species than classic cucumbers, they just don't get powdery mildew, downy mildew. The cucumber beetles don't even recognize them as having cucurbitacin, which is great, which is remarkable. So yes, salt and pepper is my favorite with cucamelons, um, Mexican gherkins as number two. Um, Mako has a question. Um, he's amended his soil with green sand this year and notices much vigorous improvement. How often should it be added? That's a great question. To be honest, my friend, I don't use green sand in our lives. So to be honest, I would just go to Google to do some homework and I certainly can't tell you from my own experience. So I apologize to disappoint you. And it's true if you're wondering, how does she know everything? Now you know, I don't. And I'm constantly learning all the time. So I'm glad we get to learn about green sand together. I know many farms use it. It just happens to be a blind spot. And thanks for helping me be curious and learn more. Um, Jen wonders, can I plant bush beans where my sugar snap peas are finishing their growing? Absolutely. Yes. Great question. Um, so that brings into the conversation something that I'll just mention and hopefully briefly, I'm woefully capable of monologues. So cut me off at any time. So rotation is really important, especially at a larger scale. And so think of, you know, when we are driving past all of these fields of monocrops, of corn, of soybeans, of wheat. So if you're, if it's a crop rotation where you're not just following, growing corn after you're growing corn after you're growing corn, that's a really toxic system. But if you, and so as that you get at a smaller scale, it's less toxic, but it's still crucial, it's still important. And especially at a home scale, like I am really bad at math, but this is maybe a 20 by 40 foot garden that I'm here, our friend Bill and Carol's garden. And 
with this scale garden, I really wouldn't can be concerned at all about rotating crops at this scale. There's already peas and beans and kale and nasturtiums and zinnias all over the place all together. The only exception to that would be alliums. Alliums, and that includes garlic, onions, leeks, scallions, anything in that kind of pungent oniony family. They can, they have some very specific nutrient requirements and some diseases that can build up in less than lovely ways, even at small scales. So that would be the only exception, but absolutely follow your peas with beans and enjoy every bite. And the last question I have is from Brooke. Um, what did you plant today? I'm so curious to know what your day looked like. Oh my gosh. Well, to be honest, my mother is visiting. And so I did not sow a single seed today. <laughs> Actually, that's not even true. We were walking in one of, in Fillmore Glen, just outside Ithaca. And <laughs> I saw a columbine seed head that had <laughs> gone to seed and a columbine flower that had gone to seed. So I looked inside its seed head and just saw there were a few seeds in there and then had the audacity to just put them in my hand and look at them and then sprinkle them somewhere else along the Glen. <laughs> so <laughs> that's been my day. <laughs> and then while you were answering that question, um, question about alliums, can you rotate across alliums like planting garlic in the space one year and leeks the next? Yes, I, I would, but if you can possibly, if you can possibly give three growing seasons, between those spaces, between those plants in the same plant family, so much the better. Three years is the dream. Um, but just make sure, yeah, that you, if you aren't, if you're going that one year, make sure that you're just adding lots of good fertility in the meantime. Um, Anthony wonders what is best to spray on plants with powdery mildew if you did not plant mildew resistant seeds? <laughs> quality question my friend so i'm about to share a huge blog on powdery mildew and so stay tuned um but here's here's my general two cents once your plant has powdery mildew there are hundreds of anecdotal things that you can do the internet will surround you with several lifetimes <laughs> of things to experiment with what I have learned is that short of really toxic chemicals, powdery mildew is kind of here to stay. Once you see it on your plants, it's once you have that visual of it, it's already systemic within the plant. So you can topically, you can kind of treat the symptom, but you're not going to cure your plant. And so the key thing here is prevention. Prevention is the best cure for many things and powdery mildew is no exception. So um, again, to just recap ways to prevent powdery mildew um, is just making sure that your soil is really nice and rich, well balanced, um, and then making sure that your plants are really well spaced. So are there less than two feet between your zucchinis? If so, they're too close and that excess humidity and limited airflow is just you're asking for disease to come in that much sooner. So that includes thinning too, if you're direct sowing, which I love you, your, your, your cucumbers and zucchini do too, love being direct sown. And so if you're sowing multiple seeds close to each other but not thinning um, as soon as those leaves start to overlap, that also is just setting you up for being more susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, so yes, I'll be sharing in that blog a few anecdotal things that you can do too, but honestly, I would just encourage you to be thinking about what are ways that you can be focusing on succession sowing. You've got plenty of time now um, here in zone five to be succession sowing cucumbers and zucchini again. So just where in your garden can you be plotting out that spot? So with that disease resistant variety, how can you culturally surround it with the environment where it would be less susceptible? Um, Renee wonders, can you sow nigella at the end of the summer for next year? You know, I imagine in some places that hasn't been my experience here in the Finger Lakes in zone five. Um, 
So I'd encourage you to save seed rather than spreading them in the fall. Um, but you know, I'm constantly amazed by the tenacity of seeds. So I encourage you to do both. Save some seeds so that you are, will have plenty for next year for you to sow. Save a few more so that you can share them with other people you love. And then scatter a few so you might possibly be creating a new variety that is that much more resilient in the world. <laughs> Um, Katie Doyle would like some lettuce advice. How do you know when to pull lettuce? For example, how long is it edible after it starts growing tall? Mine are like two feet, but still seem edible. <laughs> yes, great question. So your lettuce is edible as long as you think it's edible. Don't let anyone from Martha Stewart to me tell you that it's not edible anymore. If you taste it and you think it's delicious, you are right and never doubt yourself. So, you know, there are plenty of people who would say this lettuce is way too better. And I love bitter greens, but honestly, it's in really rich soil and it's been really well watered. So it's surprisingly sweet and tender, even at this very elongated stage. So here's the, here's the fun little fact. Ooh, I'm trying to get away from saying facts because it's just so empirical and imperial. <laughs> so here's a fun little observation. <laughs> so lettuce, when it, before it bolts, is glossy. The leaves are glossy. And just before it starts to bolt, was just before it starts to elongate its stem and ultimately start to produce seeds rather than leaves, it starts to turn matte, more dull. It loses that gloss. And so you can often start to see and actually be harvesting that lettuce, especially as seed growers ourselves, we're, we remove the first 10, 15% of all of our lettuce that bolt so that we're actively selecting for varieties that bolt less quickly. And so, but we still, you know, we want to have our cake and eat it too. So we want to be making those selections, but harvesting that lettuce before they're five feet tall. And so, yeah, look, now keep keep an eye out in your garden for your glossy leaves. And so I can't wait for you to see when you see that mat start to go. And also, if you don't know about Celtus, I'm glad I get to be a, introducing you to this delectable phenomena. Um, just a quick aside, Celtus is spelled S-C-E-L-T-U-C-E, -E, Celtus, and it is lettuce. And there are particular varieties that are cultivated for Celtus, but honestly, you can use, you can create it with any variety that's bolting. And you want to wait till the base of this bolting lettuce is a couple inches in diameter. And so it's going to be the better part of five feet tall, like the better part of my height tall. And at that point, the leaves are often really bitter. Um, but that inner marrow of the lettuce stem is sweet, it's creamy, it's so special. And take all the leaves off, put it in your oven at like 400 for 10 minutes. And it's the craziest thing to slice that stem in half. <laughs> and then literally like the marrow inside is absurdly delicious. <laughs> and it takes, look up recipes, it's it's easy to not get it right <laughs> but and there are certain varieties um, that have been selected for this literally over hundreds of years um, and then a final little note on things to look for in your lettuce if you're if you can pluck that lettuce leaf and perhaps you can see well you can't see <laughs> if the latex if that sap inside the leaf is clear it's going to be not that bitter. As soon as the latex, the sap coming out of the leaves is white, that milky white latex is now bitter and it's sticky. And there's a lot of other compounds that are just distinctly not delicious. And so at that point, that's when that latex is actually white. I stop eating lettuce at that point generally. <laughs> Um, Kate Monticelli is wondering, do you recommend a days to maturity range for a plant to be considered short slash quick season? For context, I've received non-zone specific emails from seed companies that say to try to plant violas or nasturtiums for fall blooms. Wow. 
Yeah, they are definitely south of the Mason-Dixon line, I think. <laughs> I mean, you could probably plant nasturtiums now and you get a few plants, uh, you get a few blossoms. Um, but yeah, uh, I would, that's a great question. And um, really speaks to how seed industry is an industry, right? It's not, it's not this for us, by us, bioregional phenomena as it has been for 10,000 plus years. And, and it still was 150 years ago. And I, f I feel if I do my work well, 150 years from now, we won't even need seed companies. Maybe that's another conversation, but we certainly will have a lot more regional adapted seed and ideally not like being distributed by people selling seeds, um, which is all to say days to maturity can be really helpful. They can also be um, less helpful, but I think if you are here in zone five and you're paying attention to that succession sowing chart, which I shared with Stacy, that will be in the replay that will also be below this on our webinar um, archive library on our website um, for you to download there too. Um, if you follow that, those general rules, and then yes, totally, if you're going to grow fall broccoli, go for early, quicker days to maturity. Also like fall, fall peas, for example, I love sowing fall peas. They're the sweetest, most tender seeds of the peas of the entire season. But one of the reasons that we're sowing dwarf and compact instead of full-size peas is because their days to maturity are so much, they're so much more truncated. And so, you know, those quick days to maturity for those later season crops are crucial for those succession sown. So pay attention to days to maturity, but also just cold hardiness. Um, and regional regional relevance and feel free to like ask questions of those seed companies too so that they know that people are asking those questions and not just taking verbatim what they're saying because they're trying to sell you more seeds trust me i don't know how i sleep at night sending out emails where i'm like buy seeds i'm like ah god don't buy more seeds just ask better questions please and if you need seeds i've got them <laughs> welcome to <laughs> my existential crises. <laughs> so yes, ask questions of your seed companies and of anyone you're getting seed from so that they know that you're a critical thinker and that you're a critical you know, person wanting to sow seeds with greater um, integrity and you want to be more successful. They want you to be successful too because <laughs> they want you to be successful and buy more seeds from them. So ask more questions in conclusion. <laughs> And speaking of that, are there any more questions? Because the amazing Petra has answered everything that you've thrown out at her so far. But if there are any more, um, we've got about five minutes left or so. If you don't be shy. Um, do you have any experience with copper tape for slug control? Ooh, I don't have any experience with copper tape or slug control. Um, I wonder if anyone does have experience, if you'd love to come off mute. Oh my gosh, Brooke, I see your hand is up. And yeah, tell us everything. I'm actually I'm actually um, zooming in from the Bay Area and we have tons of fog here and tons of slugs, including, so we have like three different varieties of slugs. We have the brown slugs, we have black slugs, and then we also have banana slugs, which are about this big, no joke. And they're bright yellow. Um, it's the UC Santa Cruz, uh, um, mascot, <laughs> the banana slug is. Um, so we use um, copper tape and I'll put it around pots. Um, but I've noticed that if you just do one strip, it's not often enough. So sometimes I'll put a strip on the outside of a pot, sometimes on the inside of a wooden veggie bed, and then also down at the very, very bottom of the pot or the bottom of the veggie bed. Um, and But you have to do it more than once. Usually one strip is not enough, but I have had luck. Yes. Amazing. Brooke, thank you. I'm so excited to get some and to try some and sending love to the Bay Area. And I have so many fond memories <laughs> of banana slugs. I hope we get to talk gardens and banana slugs more in our lives. <laughs> Brooke, I have a question too. Um, what is your most cold hardy vegetable? Uh, 
I would say mosh. Potentially garlic, though. And also potentially Claytonia. So I'd say those three. Um, and yeah, check out some mosh is spelled M-A-C-H-E. And I don't claim to speak German. I'm pretty confident they say it a little differently in Germany. They also say my name very differently in Germany. <laughs> so really, you don't want to take me as an authority on how to pronounce mosh. But I can tell you that it's delicious and grows really well in very short seasons, our friend. Um, just outside Denali grows it. Um, just outside in Alaska grows it in her garden. Also Claytonia, which also is sending love to the Bay Area. I can't wait to tell you about my <laughs> experience out on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, oh, I'm forgetting. What is that um, peninsula that's like just above the Bay Area that's actively like leaving the continent for, on the San Andreas Fault um, point. No, are you there? No way, Brooke. What is it called? I'm totally spacing on the name. <laughs> so we call it the peninsula. It's the San Francisco Peninsula. Yeah. And I, I literally live, my road is the San Andreas Fault. So that's what I lose sleep about. <laughs> that's amazing. And yes, oh my gosh, Anthony, I love you coming through in the chat. Point Reyes. I had an amazing experience in Point Reyes with Miner's Lettuce that was like two feet tall up to my knees and I didn't know what it was. Um, but I was just backpacking for myself by myself for a week, like 20 plus years ago. And I was like, this has got to be delicious. And I ate like two pounds of it at least every day <laughs> and for a week, not knowing what it was. Anyway, it's two feet tall in Point Reyes and <laughs> right or, and in Brooks Garden, probably. I'm so jealous. But ours, it gets about six inches tall, which I'll totally take. <laughs> and it's incredibly cold hardy. And, and it just, it literally doesn't even germinate. If you were going to sow it in your garden now, in the heat of summer, it's a weed here. Oh my gosh, yes. I can't wait to come visit again one day. These are the dreams of my life. I just love Placonia. Um, but if you sowed it now in the heat of summer, it literally isn't even going to germinate in soils that are above 65 degrees. So you have to wait until, honestly, we don't sow ours until second week in September. And as the, so the soil is cooling down, that's when mosh, that's when claytonia are starting to germinate. And so, yeah, mosh, claytonia, and garlic are three incredibly cold hardy vegetables. Um. Oh Marina has a question about a Japanese beetle infestation. What to do after trying cast foul soap and they keep coming back. And by the way, I'm just asking for a friend. Seriously, I am. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I can be that friend. <laughs> I mean, we, I feel your pain. We've just started squishing them in earnest. And if you aren't already squishing them, honestly, accept no imitations. And this is where large scale agriculture won't have solutions because they can't squish <laughs> on any kind of scale. But you in your garden, you got this. And if you can't squish them, I really struggle squishing things with a hard exoskeleton. So I sometimes will just collect them into buckets, not buckets, but like yogurt containers, for example, or Tupperware. So yeah, here's what I love to do. Go out with your container, have water in the bottom so that they can't just fly out of the container. Have some water in the bottom. And then in the evening, as it starts to cool down and they're less like vivacious and slightly less mobile, go and keep in mind that one of their brilliant strategies, why they've been so wildly successful across the eons, is that as soon as they feel like something might predate them, they just take their their legs and go like this and fall down. And so <laughs> that's why having your hand, no, a bucket there with water to catch them. So I literally see them and I'm, so I'm like bringing that container underneath where they are. And then I don't even have to squish them or try to squish them. I just like kind of rustle them off <laughs> the branch, off the leaf into the container. And then, you know, soapy water would kill them, but our friends with chickens have, this great delight in going over and just offering this <laughs> all these Japanese beetles to them. Um, so that's our strategy. But yes, there are certainly Japanese beetle traps. What I've seen with that, and um, 
and what I've heard from lots of other people, it's dubious whether they're trapping more or attracting more because they're using pheromones to bring them in. So yeah, I feel like um, at the risk of, yes, chickens love them. <laughs> we don't, none of us are alone. We don't garden alone. We don't do anything in a vacuum. <laughs> We're participants in this glorious experiment of life on earth. And yeah, bring on all the other species. <laughs> and what is that weak link of, you know, that is a brilliant adaptation that they have to just drop from wherever they are but how can we just use that as the like what's the weak link in the armor right the David and Goliath moment and that's it for Japanese beetles for sure what's your opinion about using yellow sticky traps for bugs oh I think they're great they do a lot of uh good trapping all kinds of things <laughs> and also you know I mean they're all filled with you know uh you know, adhesives and lots of, they're just, there's a lot of fossil fuels involved in making them. So I don't know if people a hundred years from now are going to have that option, but it's certainly an interesting thing always to see who is sticking to them. I tend to see beneficials as well as, you know, the pest insects on them. So I don't know that it's necessarily a great way to control pest insects. Um, but as an awesome way to just see what is the diversity in your garden <laughs> for a brief moment in time. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't suggest them as a, an opportunity to control any kind of pest insect. A couple people point out that honeybees and other beneficials could be trapped. Yes, without yeah. question, without question. Yeah. And that, my friend, was your last question. And it is 7.03, so good job. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Karen. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank you. Be a recording sent to everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.